Shalom. This is lesson 37 in the series called The Gospel According to Moses, Exodus. And this is Reverend John Ferret. And if you might recall, for those of you that have been following the series and doing one lesson after another, in lessons 33 through 36, dealing with God's instruction that means Torah, not law, but Torah, God's instruction, we were dealing with the Passover. So God is talking about Passover, what it is, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the meaning of it. We saw some amazing insights that surfaced as we were studying this since the beginning of chapter 12. The connections of Passover to Egypt that God was using aspects of what he was commanding his people to do in Passover connected to Egypt, like unleavened bread. The Egyptians, from a historical point of view, were the ones that invented leavening of bread. Their gods were associated with bread. And so it says, if God is saying, you will eat unleavened bread to separate his people from Egypt. We saw the amazing connections of that Passover in 1446 B.C. to Yeshua. We found that perhaps we should not be mixing up the lambs. There's a Passover lamb and the Lamb of God. Each is unique. Each lamb is distinct. Each lamb has a specific purpose. And each lamb has a unique meaning. And we found that Jesus is not the Passover lamb. We studied this in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. The Greek says it exactly. Jesus is the Passover. That's it. The Greek word is Pascha. And Pascha, in Thayer's Greek lexicon, is associated to the Hebrew word Pesach. Not Pasach, but Pesach. And Pesach, in the Gesenius Hebrew lexicon, means protection or shelter or immunity. No way is Jesus like the Passover lamb. He is God's Passover, God's protection, God's shelter. So, we've had this major interruption Exodus 12. All this Passover stuff was put in here by the Lord. And it's very interesting that in Exodus 12, verse 25, he basically says, do this when you get to the land that I'm taking you. They didn't have to do this during their sojourn in the wilderness. Just when Moses left Pharaoh back in chapter 11 verse 8 in anger that's we remember that point Moses had warned Pharaoh of the last plague and so we were waiting for the hammer to come down just when that was supposed to happen all of a sudden we get this interlude but now it's time it's now time to continue and to focus in on the last judgment, the last hammer, the last plague that is going to fall. Let's take a look at verses in the New American Standard Bible, Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 through 30. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Notice that he just does not say, that he struck all the Egyptian firstborn. He said all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. It's midnight. It's the 15th of Nisan. This is the first month. If you remember back 
in the beginning of chapter 12, God said, this is the first month of the year for you, month of Nisan. And on the 15th of Nisan, God instructed his people to sacrifice the lamb, sacrifice the lamb on the 14th of Nisan, in the afternoon, before sunset. After that, they were then to have their Passover meal after sundown, which is now Nisan 15. Now, these are lunar months. Now, a lunar month basically is the first day of the month. In our case, now we're studying, Nisan 1 would be the day of the new moon. The first day when the new moon is seen. And two weeks later, Nisan 15 is the night of the full moon. A Passover meal was on that night. One of the things that I am just amazed at is once again how scholars across the board have forgot about the Egyptian culture. Let me give you the example. There's a god by the name of Khonsu. In the 18th dynasty, and this is the time of the 18th dynasty, 1446 BC, under Amenhotep II, the pharaoh of the Exodus, this is the 18th dynasty, Khonsu was considered the greatest of all the great gods. He's the moon god. He's considered the only son of Amun-Ra, the god of the sun, the sun god. His mother was Mut, which in Egyptian means mother. She's the he, Kamsu, is the only son. He's the firstborn of the father of the gods, Ra. Ra, the sun god, now associated with Amun. Amun Ra in these days. In plague number nine, there was darkness. It's almost as if the Torah is trying to tell us that God came against Ra, Amun Ra, the father of all gods. And now on the 10th plague, on the 15th of Nisan, on the night of the full moon, it's almost as if the firstborn of the father of all gods, the firstborn son of Amun Ra, Kansu, the moon god, it's almost as if the Torah is saying, the Bible is saying that God came against his firstborn son. And Mut, the mother, the mother goddess of all creation, all the way since plague number one, she could do nothing. Now God told us this quite explicitly in Exodus 12, verse 12. He said, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God destroyed seemingly what was known then as the Theban Trinity. Amun-Ra, Mut, and their only begotten son, Kansu. So imagine that you're a Hebrew 3,400 years ago. they probably had assimilated into the Egyptian culture. We talked about that in earlier lessons. It's likely they understood stood this, not us. And once again, I am so amazed across the board, commentary after commentary, Bible historian after Bible historian. This is just a part of ancient Egyptian history at the time of the 18th dynasty in 1446 B.C. <sighs> I think it is very important that we study our Bible in its historical context, but also to delve into those cultures where the Bible is really reporting events that have happened, like Egypt. So those ancient Hebrews, perhaps they saw the Torah principle in action. They probably saw this. Midda kineged midah, measure for measure. Because back in Exodus 1, Chapter 1, verse 22, God, Pharaoh commanded all his people 
to drown the baby boys of Israel. But now, as far as God is concerned, it's payback. You did that to the Hebrew boys, now I'm going to do this to all of your firstborn. God's firstborn son is Israel. Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. It's almost as if this is payback. All the firstborn in Egypt would be killed. God said that vengeance is his. Let's take a look at this in Hebrew chapter 10, verse 30 to 31. So we read, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. The writer of Hebrews goes on in verse 31, and here's the verse. It's a ter terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now God talks about this, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. This is in Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 36. He's quoting Torah. And Egypt, Pharaoh, had fallen into the hands of El Elyon, God Most High. Egypt had fallen into the hands of Ha El Hayakid, the only God. Their entire society, their religion, their government, their social structure, the economy was totally in ruins. I wonder how many Egyptians turned to Adonai. They saw all this destruction. They saw all of this power. They saw that their gods were nothing. Amun-Ra, Kansu, Osiris, Isis, Hathor. I wonder how many turned to the God of Israel. With regards to the idea of the firstborn, Let's take a look at this a little bit more. God said that Israel was his son, his firstborn son, singular. Egypt was killing. Killing his firstborn son. They were drowning all the baby boys. God said perhaps that this is all payback, measure for measure. Midah, cheneged midah. He killed all the firstborn, and I'm talking about babies through adults. Is this the price to be paid? Is this the price to be paid for freedom? Let's take a look at Exodus 13, verses 14 through 15. And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. But then we read about Jesus. He was the only begotten son of the Lord. Remember, Israel is God's firstborn son, begotten by Abraham and Sarah. Miraculous birth, no doubt. But Jesus, do you talk about a miraculous birth? This is bigger, more explosive than the fact that Sarah was beyond a, beyond beyond that age of, of being able to have children. <laughs> Mary was a virgin and had a baby. How? That's the, it, it, It's beyond the miracle. Jesus, his only begotten son, his firstborn son. And so on Nisan 14, before sunset, we know it would be a night of the full moon. And the firstborn of Ha'el Hayaki, the only God, was, was killed, 
sacrificed, actually. He was the price to be paid. 1 Corinthians 6.20 Bought with the price. Acts 20.28 20, Paul is teaching us that God purchased the church with his blood. God, meaning Jesus is God. God does it again. So we take a look at previous major events, like the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And God then does something in the future, Jesus' crucifixion, and it's tied to the previous. It's, it's an engineering of history. It's, it's a control of time and events. It's like a sign from God himself of these events. He wants them tied together. Oh, they have a different meaning. There's a different redemption. But they're so connected. He's saying all of this from the redemption of his people in Egypt in 1446 B.C. to the death of his son, Jesus. All orchestrated and engineered by, by him, by his hand. And the Passover of Jesus and the Passover of Israel, you cannot have the first Passover of Jesus without the second. By the way, just a note that there is no angel of death in the Bible. If you take a look at Exodus 12, verse 23, we read that the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to smite you. That word has been... <laughs> it's a Christian midrash, and it's a rabbinic midrash. It's... it's Using the you can't use the English, and all of a sudden there's this angel of death. That Hebrew word there comes from a Hebrew verb. The Hebrew verb is meaning to destroy, to ruin. So the Hebrew word there is mashit, and the Strong's number is seventy-eight forty-three. And as a noun, it means the destroyer or destruction. And in context, we should probably read it as destruction. Because the Bible is 100% clear. The Bible tells us who killed the firstborn. Exodus 12, verse 29. The Lord struck the firstborn. Not an angel of death, not a destroyer. The Lord did it. We see the word Lord there. It's capitalized. That means that the Hebrew word Adonai is used as a substitute because in the actual original Hebrew, it's God's name. The four letters, the tetragrammaton, yud Hey vav Hey. I pronounce it Yahweh. There's no angel of death. The Torah is clear. The Lord did it, and he prevented destruction to enter into the homes of the Hebrews. So now, the journey begins. The Hebrews are going to leave. It's the 15th of Nisan, the 15th day of the first month. I wonder about the Hebrew families who may have not put blood on the doorposts. Torah's silent on that. The Torah does not say that all the Hebrews did it. I've often wondered, did everybody do what God ordered and commanded? And on top of that, if they didn't do it, they, they probably had a firstborn person in that family killed. So... Were they allowed to come? I mean, I think I would have repented to, you know, to see that. So it could very well be that 
many Hebrews who even did not put the blood on the doorpost left. Egyptians wanted them out of there. Verse 35, there again is a translation problem that Hebrew scholars point out. Verse 35 to 12, it says, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptian articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So they let them have their request, and thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now we have dealt with this before, but since you're here, I do want to come back and talk about a great Jewish scholar. Rabbi Joseph Hertz. And Rabbi Joseph Hertz talks about this Hebrew word that's been translated into English as plunder. Reading from his Torah commentary, he says this rendering that the Egyptians are going to be plundered should be replaced by the phrase that you will save the Egyptians. So is it is incorrect the impossible rendering of the Hebrew text. The root word, netzal, which is here translated as plunder or spoil or strip, the Hebrew word netzal, and the Strong's number is 5337, occurs 212 times in Scripture. And in 210 instances, instances of the 212 times, its meaning is admitted to by all to be to snatch, to snatch from danger, to rescue, like from a wild beast, to recover property that has been sl uh, stolen. So when we take a look at the words, they netzaltem netzarim. As Rabbi Hertz is saying, it can only be translated one way. You shall save the Egyptians. And Rabbi Hertz is saying that means clear their name, vindicate the humanity of the Egyptians. He goes on to say in his commentary, bitter memories and associations would have clung to the word Egyptians in the mind of the Israelites as the hereditary enslavers and oppressors of Israel, but a friendly party. And generous gifts, however would banish that feeling. The Israelites would come to see that the Egyptian people, they would come to see that their oppressors were Pharaoh and his administration, not the Egyptian people. They would be enabled thereby to carry out the command to be given them 40 years later. Thou shalt not abhor the Egyptians. 40 years later, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 8, it is for such reasons as the Israelites are bidden to ask their neighbors for these gifts in order to ensure such a parting in friendship and goodwill with its consequent clearing of the name and vindication of the honor of the Egyptian people. That is just amazing. That's such a realistic alternative that through all this, it's a way... God saving the Egyptian people. So let's go back into the Torah and start reading in verse 36. As we just read that the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not been become leavened, since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years, to the very day... All the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now in verse 37 to 38, it talks about 600,000 men. 
We also see this in Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 2, where the army is 603,550 men, based upon adding up all of the men of military age in the 12 tribes. Now, <laughs> this is very, very unrealistic. We're going to take a look at this. So some say since there were 600,000 men, we're probably dealing with 2 million people that left Egypt. One estimate is even 3 million. 2 million. Men with their wives, their children, their parents. Now 2 million, like I said, is very problematic understanding the historical context. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's 2 million that are leaving Egypt. Let's put them in rows, each row containing 20 people, 20 people across. Which means if there's 2 million, that'd be 100,000 rows of people. 100,000 rows of 20 people per row, or 2 million people. Now let's assume that these rows are four feet apart, but will allow two feet for the actual row itself, because they have to be walking. So that's six feet per row. There's 100,000 rows, so that means that the column of Hebrews leaving Egypt would be 600,000 feet dividing that by 5,280 feet per mile, that means the column was 114 miles long. Now, if you actually take a look at a modern map of the Middle East, there is a Egyptian modern city. I, I was there. My wife and I were both there. Ishmalia. The reason why we went there is archaeologists believe that this could very well be the modern site, Ishmaelia, which is built upon the site of Sukkot, which is a one-day journey from where the Israelites started from. So the distance from Ishmaelia to the Israeli border is 131 miles. The Hebrew column, if, if we talk about it, 20 people per row, 100,000 rows, 114 miles long. That's the almost the total distance from Ishmaelia to, to the edge of, of the Gaza Strip there in Israel, on the border. On top of that, if you went from Ishmaelia to Elat, which is the modern Hebrew city, right there, on the Gulf of Aqaba, on the, the it's the the port right there at the top in the northern part of the Gulf of Aqaba. That's 228 miles. So that's the distance from Ishmaelia across the Sinai Peninsula all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba. 228 miles. Can you imagine the length of the column the way I described it? I mean, I gave an example here. The column would take up half the distance between Ishmaelia and Elat. Here's another thing. It would be impossible for this, this group to cross the Sea of Galilee in one night. Let's say this group, again, 20 people per row, 6 feet per row, 4 in between each row, and 2 feet for the people walking, 6 feet per row, 114 miles long, Let's suppose they're traveling at four miles per hour. Four miles per hour. And suppose you're standing at the place where the sea split. God split the sea. Now you get this pathway across. And they're, they're going to walk through this path. And let's, like, let's say, let's just 20 people across. So you're standing there. You're looking at all the Hebrew people. And here they go. One row after another, 20 people per row, and they're traveling at four miles per hour. Now, if you walk four miles per hour, if you've done that, it's, it's just about jogging. 
I am an avid walker, and I know four miles per hour is really pushing the, you work up a good sweat. Four miles per hour with old people and babies, cattle and sheep. So in one hour, that's 21,120 feet. That would be, a, you're going four miles in an hour. So that means that how much distance is covered? 21,120 feet. Which means there's 3,520 lines of 20 per hour. Because if you divide 21,120 by 6, you come up with 3,520, which is the number of lines. Lines of 20 people per hour. But if you take 100,000, remember there's 100,000 lines, and divide that by the number of lines per hour, you come out with 28 hours to pass that spot. So in other words, the last group will be in the 28th hour. They could not cross as the Torah says, in one night. Now, there are some who actually say that the Hebrews actually traveled all the way from Ishmalia, Sukkot, the end of the wadi that exists there. And they traveled across the Sinai Peninsula and they crossed at the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, this is on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula at Nuiba. Now, if you cross the Gulf of Aqaba from the eastern shores of the Sinai Peninsula to the western shore of Saudi Arabia at Nuweiba, that's 8.6 miles. And again, 4 miles per hour? It's going to take them 28 hours just to pass the point where you're crossing. You can't do it. Real geography implies 600,000 Men can't be right. It, it makes no sense geographically. Now, I deal with this issue now because I believe it's a very critical issue. There has been a lot of debate. There are a lot of people who say, see, this is totally wrong. And therefore, they throw out the Bible as, as a fable, as, as untrue because of this number. Looking at the Inner Varsity Press Bible Commentary of the Old Testament, and I really highly recommend that every Christian have the IVP Bible background commentaries of not only the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. They, they are amazing. So from the IVP Bible Commentary of the Old Testament, and their comments about this 600,000, I quote, As it traveled, the line of people would stretch for over 200 miles. So I basically uh, put my two cents in there, and I believe the line would be, remember I said there were 20 people per row? Uh, go to a line of 10 people per row, and five, foot, five feet between each line, you're going to come up with 200,000 lines, and you finally come up to 189 miles long. So I believe IVP and their scholars are saying probably the column width was probably narrower than 20. I had it at 10. Maybe it's shorter than that. Maybe it's five people across. So anyway, they're saying it could be that the line would stretch over 200 miles. Even without animals, children, and the elderly, travelers would not expect to make 20 miles a day. Some caravans travel 20 miles per day. When families and animals move camp, the average would only be 6 miles per day. We will deal with that later on when they get to Sinai. Whatever the case, the back of the line would be at least a couple of weeks behind the front of the line. This would create some difficulties in the crossing of the sea, which seems to have been accomplished overnight. Though certainly some have calculated how it could be done. The line, however, would be long enough to stretch from, from the crossing of the sea to Mount Sinai. Now another thing that's very interesting is the population of Canaan, the Promised Land, during this period was far less than the Israelite force. 
All archaeological evidence suggests there was a sharp decline in the population of the region in the late Bronze Age, 1446 BC, when the Israelites took possession. Some estimates for the 8th century BC suggest there were still not a million people in the entire land of Israel, even by that time. The modern population of Israel, even given the extensive metropolitan regions, is only about twice what the Exodus population would have been. Many solutions have been offered, but all have problems. All of the above suggest that it's unlikely the numbers should be read the way they traditionally have been read. What are we going to do? We have no solutions, but there is a possibility. The most promising approach comes through a recognition that the Hebrew word translated thousand in those days when the Old Testament was being written can also be translated as clan, family, tribe, or a military unit or troop. In which case, there would be 600 military troops. Not troops, 600 and military groups, like a platoon, like a regiment. So we have to take a look at this in a deeper way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Dennis Prager's commentary on Exodus. He deals with the same thing. And like I said, we're dealing with this because this is a major critical number. And we have to find out how to deal with this. So this is the end of part one of Lesson 37. There's just so much here. I wanted to break this up into two manageable listening sessions. We're going to continue with this discussion and this study of the number of men, 600,000 men that left, 603,550 in the army of Israel in Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 2. We'll continue with that study in part 2 as we'll be focusing in on Dennis Prager's commentary called Exodus, the Rational Bible. So see you then in part two. <music>